Microbial Infections of the Central Nervous System, the CNS. The intended learning outcomes of this lecture are to classify microbial infections of CNS, to explain pathogenesis of microbial meningitis, to be able to identify bacterial, viral, and fungal causes of meningitis, and also to identify viral causes of encephalitis, to define slow viral diseases of the CNS, and finally, to describe pathogenesis and laboratory diagnosis of prion disease. CNS infections could be in two forms. The first form is called meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges or the membranes that envelop the brain and the spinal cord. The second form is called encephalitis. You can also call it encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain parenchyma itself. This photo demonstrates the difference between normal meninges on the left and infected meninges on the right. In normal meninges, they look completely healthy, while in infected meninges, they look congested, red in color, and covered with yellowish exudate that corresponds for pus formation. How can organisms gain access to the CNS? This occurs through several routes, but the most common and the most important is through blood in what we call hematogenous spread. This occurs through the choroid plexus or through other blood vessels of the brain and it is followed by entry of the organism into the subarachnoid space. As demonstrated in this photo, you can find that this organism can reach the CNS through the blood vessels. The second method is by direct spread from an infected site. For example, if there is mastoiditis, inflammation of the mastoid, or otitis media, infection of the middle ear, or even sinusitis, infection of the ear sinuses, like for example, frontal sinus, all these infections, if they are neglected, they can spread to the CNS. Another route is through anatomic defects in CNS structure. This can result from surgery, from trauma, or uh, sometimes from congenital abnormalities as demonstrated in this photo. Finally, the organism can travel along peripheral nerves in order to reach the CNS in what we call direct intraneural spread. This is considered the least common method, and it actually uh, used by viruses, like, for example, rabies virus and herpes simplex virus. As demonstrated in this photo, after a dog bite, the rabies virus can replicate for a while in the muscle. But after that, it uses the axon of the peripheral nerve in order to reach the CNS. Let's start now with meningitis. Meningitis can be presented clinically in two forms, either acute or chronic, depending on the onset and the overall progression within the host. With acute meningitis, the symptoms develop in acute form. These symptoms uh, consist of fever, stiff neck, headache, nausea, and vomiting, neurologic abnormalities and change in the mental status in the form of drowsiness, stupor, or even coma. And when you examine the CSF or the cerebrospinal fluid in this case, uh, you will find large number of inflammatory cells. You will find more than uh, 1,000 cell per cubic millimeter, and they are formed mainly of polymorph nuclear cells or pus cells. In chronic meningitis, the condition is different. You will find this condition mainly in immunocompromised patients, and there is an insidious onset of symptoms. And you may not find all the symptoms, 
and they may persist for a longer period, for months, for example. And when you examine the CSF, you will find also a large number of cells, but they are formed mainly of lymphocytes, not polymorph-like in acute condition. Now let's go to the microbial causes of meningitis. Meningitis can be caused by bacteria, and in this case we call it pyogenic or purulent, which means formation of pus. Can be caused also by viruses. In this case, we call it viral or aseptic meningitis, which denotes uh, no pus formation. Or it can be caused also by fungi. And in this case, uh, usually it is in the form of chronic meningitis. In bacterial meningitis, the patients typically have a marked acute exudative inflammation in the meninges. And the CSF contains large number of polymorph nuclear cells, or pus cells as we have mentioned. And frequently, the underlying tissue of the CNS is involved, uh, commonly the ventricles. And in this case, we call the condition ventriculitis. In this case, the respiratory tract is usually the primary portal of entry for bacteria. So the bacteria enters from the respiratory tract and then can gain access to the CNS through the hematogenous route, as we have previously mentioned. Now, what are the bacteria that can cause meningitis, the types of bacteria? You can see that there are three types typed in red color because they are the most common and the most important types. They include Neisseria meningitidis or meningococci, Haemophilus influenza type B, and Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococci. All these bacteria are capsulated. They have polysaccharide capsule. And if you remember, this capsule makes the organism more virulent. It makes it resist phagocytosis and become more invasive. Unfortunately, we have vaccines against the three types. Other bacteria that also can cause meningitis include Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Staphylococci, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella approaches, uh, anaerobes, and even spirochetes. You can classify meningitis according to the age of your patient, and this classification is very useful clinically. In neonates, you will find that there are three types of bacteria which are very common, which are group B, beta hemolytic streptococci or streptococcus A. galactia, E. coli, and Listeria monocytogens. Why these bacteria? Because they can be acquired from the birth canal of the mother during delivery. In children more than six months, you will find the three common causes, uh, which are pneumococci, meningococci, and haemophilus influenza type B. While in adolescents and young adults, Neisseria meningitidis is the commonest. What about viral meningitis? Viral meningitis is also called aseptic meningitis, which means that there is no or there is very little pus formation. The main cell that you will find in the CSF is lymphocytes or other mononuclear cells in what we call pleocytosis. This is one difference from the bacterial meningitis. Another difference is that you are going to find that bacterial and fungal cultures are all negative because you know that viruses do not grow on conventional cultures. They need cell culture to grow. Another difference in, is in aseptic meningitis, the condition is usually self-limiting and the conditions uh, is less severe. What are the viruses that can cause meningitis? They include first enteroviruses like Coxsackie viruses, Echoviruses, and poliovirus. Also, mumps virus, herpes simplex type 2, and human immunodeficiency virus. Poliovirus is the virus that is responsible for the children, but also can cause illness. مامس فيروس اللي هو الفيروس المسبب للنكاف أو التهاب الغدة النكافية. Now let's go to fungal causes and uh, they usually lead to chronic meningitis. All fungi that can cause 
systemic mycosis can also cause meningitis. But the most important and the most common is the yeast fungus Cryptococcus pneumoformis. Other fungi like Coxidiodus, Histoplasma, Plastomyces, and even Candida and Aspergillus may also be involved. Now let's move to uh, another topic, which is encephalitis or encephalitis. As we have mentioned, it is an acute inflammation of the brain parenchyma, and uh, it is usually caused by viruses. Sometimes the meninges are also involved with the brain, and in this case, we call it meningoencephalitis. The cellular infiltrate that is present in the CSF in this condition is typically formed of lymphocyte and not polymorph nuclear cells. The viruses causing encephalitis include rabies virus, which is the commonest rabies virus, virus اللي بيجي عقب التعرض لعضة من حيوان مصاب ممكن يكون الحيوان ده دج أو ممكن يكون حيوان ثدي آخر. Also we have cytomegalovirus, influenza virus and rubella virus. Rubella virus اللي هو الفيروس المسبب لمرض الحصبة الألمانية. Also we have another group of viruses called collectively arboviruses because they are transmitted by arthropod. This include equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile encephalitis, which, tra which is transmitted by mosquitoes and can be present here in Egypt, lacrosse encephalitis and Poisson encephalitis. In addition to the typical meningitis and the typical encephalitis, we have another form of CNS infection called slow viral diseases of the CNS. These diseases usually develop very, very slowly, and they are of two categories. The first one is caused by conventional viruses, and the second one is caused by unconventional infectious proteins, which is called prions. Let's start by the diseases caused by conventional viruses. We have four forms. The first one is called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Each part of its name denotes certain data. Progressive means it increases with time. Multifocal means it involves multiple areas of the brain. Leuco means it is a demyelinating disease. It destroys the myelin of the CNS. Encephalopathy means that there is no inflammation because if there is inflammation, uh, it would rather be called encephalitis, but here it is called encephalopathy or encephalopathy. So this is means that it is a pathology, but without producing inflammation. This disease is a fatal disease. It is caused by a virus called JC virus, and it occurs in immunocompromised patients. Another form is called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Panencephalitis means it involves all the brain, not related to certain areas. And there is some sort of inflammation because it is called encephalitis. This is a rare complication of the measles virus, the virus al-hasba, when it is acquired in young age and it usually leads to mental and motor deterioration. Actually, it decreases markedly after the wide application of measles vaccine. A third form is called progressive rubella panencephalitis, which is a rare complication of rubella infection when it is congenitally acquired or when acquired in a young age and it leads to mental and motor deterioration. And finally, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS caused by HIV virus also can lead to slow disease of the CNS leading mainly to dementia. The second group of these slow diseases, though it is classified as being viral diseases, they are not caused by conventional viruses, but they are caused by unconventional agents called 
prions. What is prion? Prion is a cellular protein found in normal cells and it is encoded by an endogenous gene located on human chromosome number 20. But it can exist in two conformational forms or two conformational isotopes. The first one is called PRPC, stands for prion protein cellular. This is the cellular form present in normal brains and its conformation is mainly in the alpha helical form. The second form is called PRPSC, stands for prion protein scrappy. This is uh, the form uh, associated with disease and its conformation is mainly in the beta pleated form. This photo demonstrates the difference between the normal and the abnormal uh, prion protein. In the normal case, you will find that the conformation is in the helical form, as you can see. But in diseased one, you will form that the conformation has been changed to the beta pleated form, as in this case. Prions are infectious which means that they can replicate. But surprisingly, these particles are formed only of protein material with no detectable nucleic acids. How can they replicate without nucleic acid? They can facilitate the conversion of the normal cellular protein into the abnormal protein they can change the conformation of the normal protein. What's the problem? The problem is that the scrappy protein or the abnormal protein resists protease degradation and accumulates in neurons. This results in what we call spongiform encephalopathy. The neurons are destroyed and are replaced by spongiform material. This leads to dementia, ataxia, and even death. The second problem is that there is no host immune response against these proteins. The body considers them as self proteins. So there is no immune response against them. Another problem is that this agent is resistant to standard sterilizing procedures, including standard autoclaving. It's also resistant to inactivation by formaldehyde and many other disinfectants. This could raise a possibility of their transmission by surgical implants. Uh, fortunately, this agent can be inactivated by 90% phenol, ether, hypochlorite, sodium hydroxide, and acetone, the agents can that can affect proteins. Another problem is that this agent is also resistant to temperatures used for cooking which points to its ability to be transmitted by ingestion of food. From the previous data, you can conclude that the modes of prion transmission are first, transplantation of CNS-related tissue, like for example, transplantation of the cornea or the dura mater, and in this case, we call it iatrogenic infection because it results from a medical procedure. And the second mode is uh, through ingestion of contaminated food from infected animal products. The incubation period is so long, it reaches months or even years, and the disease is usually confined to the central nervous system. Prion diseases can develop in both human and in animals. In human, we have three forms. The first form is called creutzfeldt jakob disease. This is transmitted by surgical manipulation and causes progressive dementia, tremors, and lack of motor coordination. And it usually develops in older people, in people aged from 50 to 70 years. Another form is called new variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. This variant is transmitted by ingestion of infected animal products, and it causes mainly psychiatric problems and it develops in younger age, in patients less than 40 years. The third form is called Kuru, 
and this disease develops in certain tribes which are practicing human cannibalism. Cannibalism uh, 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 these people uh, who ingest uh, human flesh or human internal organs. Prion diseases can also develop in animals, and in animals we have two forms. First one is called scrappy, which is a disease of sheep, results in behavioral changes, progressive tremors, ataxia, wasting, and death. The second form is called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, also known as mad cow disease which is transmitted to cows by eating food supplemented with infected brain of sheep with scrappy. What about the laboratory diagnosis of prion disease? In order to diagnose it, you can have brain biopsy, and this is usually obtained after death, so it is autopsy. You can also perform CSF examination, serum examination, or you can have a biopsy from the tonsillar or other lymphoid tissue. In brain biopsy, you can perform histopathological examination to detect the spongiform changes in the brain tissue. Or you can stain the brain tissue using labeled monoclonal antibodies directed against this abnormal protein in what we call immune staining. In CSF, you will find elevated level of certain proteins called 1433 and also protein called S100. And in serum, you will find an elevated level of protein S100 and uh, in tonsillar and other lymphoid tissue biopsy, you can also detect the presence of this abnormal protein using the monoclonal antibody-based assays. Uh, unfortunately, till now, there is no curative treatment against prion diseases. This is the end of our lecture. These are the references that you can use. And thank you so much.